It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's Going Down is a digital community center from anarchist, anti-fascist, autonomous, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial movements. Our mission is to provide an autonomous and resilient platform to publicize and promote revolutionary theory and action. Go to itsgoingdown.org for daily updates. Check out our online store for ways to donate and rate and follow us on iTunes if you like this podcast. My name is Lauren Regan. I am the founder, executive director, and one of the senior staff attorneys at the Civil Liberties Defense Center. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, it was great talking to you last time, and we're so excited to have you back again. There's a lot to talk about, as we were already discussing before we started recording. But since the last time we talked, there's been so much that happened. Um, Trump is out, of course. Biden is in. And there's a lot of talk now following the far-right storming of the Capitol in D.C. to clamp down on, quote, extremism. I'm really curious, broadly speaking, what are your thoughts about the present situation and all this talk about new laws regarding domestic terrorism, quote-unquote? Well, I think if we use history as our teacher, um, we know that there have been several circumstances where People with authoritarian tendencies have used these quote unquote emergencies to push agendas that really aren't exactly tied to the emergency that they're claiming. And I think a lot of people are making comparisons right now to like 9-11 and pushing the Patriot Act through, which was actually the FBI's wish list from a decade earlier. And I think we see, you know, this again where um, people are trying to limit the First Amendment rights of people within the United States, and they're trying to do it all the time, and they're using this as an opportunistic possibility to try and justify that. But especially when I see people who claim to be left of center, you know, arguing for protections from white supremacists and other people, you know, I roll my eyes just because historically time and time again, um, it has always, you know, kind of rolled out that despite um, laws or protections being touted as going after the far right and, you know, for the protection of the rest of us, those, those laws always get twisted around and used on the left. So I don't think anybody should be cheering the idea of these like quote unquote domestic terrorist laws, um, being used as protections or as weapons against far right extremism because you only really need to look back even a decade ago, you know, during the green scare, which I think we talked about last time, um, you know, the FBI and the U S attorney's office basically tried to invoke the terrorism enhancement against left environmental and animal rights activists that used economic sabotage as a tactic, um, you know, almost, symbolic arson when when we look back on it now there were not any threats to humans there you know weren't any like communiques left saying we're going to come kill you or you know any of those types of things but yet the state you know dusted off this terrorist enhancement and basically um the terrorist enhancement penalty is really similar to a lot of these domestic terrorist bills that are being bandied about where they're basically saying like if your intent is to coerce the government and you commit a crime in doing so um you know it could potentially be this domestic terrorism crime so uh i would say you know this is an episode that we've seen before um usually it plays out the same way 
And I would be really highly skeptical of any new laws that are required. I think there are ample, ample criminal laws on the books and just gazillions of dollars in law enforcement, technology, surveillance, enforcement. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of reasons why uh, the far right, you know, has kind of gone unchecked till now. And I think a lot of it has to do with corporate power, capitalism, you know, just power structures in general, rather than whatever label is put on, um, you know, a bill or a piece of legislation. Yeah, I'm literally looking at an article from the New York Times about how the Department of Justice, uh, you know, overlooked the threat of far right and instead, you know, hunkered down and focused on Black Lives Matter, anarchists, and anti-fascists. Uh, but of course, for people that listen to this show, that's not uh, exactly news. Um, so, f- but just going forward, so from what we understand, um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is going to be conducting a thorough threat assessment on domestic violent extremism. So what are your thoughts on this? This seems to be the first step in what will become possibly either new laws or some new plan on countering domestic extremism, quote unquote. What what will it mean for them to do a threat assessment? Yeah, I mean, I, my understanding is that that threat assessment is being coordinated by um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and I, my understanding is that they're being tasked to develop policy. Um, so they are claiming that they're going to do like a policy review and then, um, you know, figure out how they can do better for the people, um, which of course we know, you know, is, is, is pretty crap. So right now, what we're being told is that we're only at the policy level, not on the actual legislative level. You know, it's not that they're trying at this point to enact new laws. But what I would say is that they're going to try to put together a pretty document that supports whatever approach they want to take. And so if that is... um you know, investing in a bunch of weaponry because there are people profiting off of, um, you know, stocks and investment in the weapons industry, then, you know, we'll see, see the policy probably end up, you know, favoring that, that, um, that particular area, I think. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I think I mentioned to you to this when we first started talking about this, this interview, my, my overall take is, you know, I've, I've been a lawyer now for 23 years and I've been in the movement for longer than that. And I don't think there's been a minute since I started doing this work where there hasn't been some threat uh, you know, some pending loss, you know, legislation, some crime, some something task force, you know, blah, 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 going on up and down in its severity and fear factor. Um, so, you know, I think taking a step back, state repression has always been a thing um, and it's always going to be a thing. And rather than focusing on the label that is being given to the repression at this very moment, I really wish that we could focus more of our creative powers on figuring out ways to navigate around it and to dance around it because they get a lot of attention for putting together these task forces and to put these policy documents together. But the only reason that those policy documents have any power at all is if we become apathetic or complicit in response to them. If I read a piece of paper and I get scared, oh gosh, the federal government is saying that if I walk my dogs off leash, I'm a terrorist. I'll read that document and then decide that, 
it's not worth it. And I'll walk my dogs on a leash from now on. Um, you know, I think that a lot of what we see with state repression is with the hope that the masses will be good sheep and will just kind of do as they're told. Um, so, you know, I think that's the one, one thing, you know, the first thing I would say is basically know your history or you're bound to repeat it. And I feel like that is very much the case when we start talking about these really highly charged, scandalous, um, you know, headlines that either social media or mainstream media wants us to see and react to. There seems to be some plans already put on the table, but it seems like the state is talking about uh, more resources for agencies working together, sort of doubling down on what we've already seen with JGTF units and fusion centers. Curious if you have any insight as to what this post-assessment strategy from the state will be. Well, I mean, on the one hand, I think that the realities of technology um, have in many ways changed the nature of these like JTTF situations. Like I think when they first started, it was literally like undercover officers going to vegan potlucks. You know, now it's more like somebody sits behind a computer monitor all day long and monitors social media for intelligence. So in some ways, these JTTF types of data sharing and surveillance sharing I have gone hand in hand with the technology. Um, yeah, I think Standing Rock was a pretty interesting example of how um digital surveillance um, played such a large part at both the federal, state, and local levels of trying to crush that indigenous-led protest movement. Um, you know, I think it also is pretty classic in that once um, people's First Amendment rights were, you know, kind of being utilized to good effect, all of a sudden you see a bunch of state laws being uh, drafted, you know, m taking away criminal punishment for running down humans on roadways and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of back and forth in terms of surveillance, joint terrorism task force types of operations and then, you know, Alex style laws also coming into play. So, I think that whenever you are, I guess, you know, at its core, whenever they start talking about things like joint terrorism task forces, um, they're going to try to argue that it is more efficient for them to be sharing the resources. But I think the reality is that um, it's a suck hole for additional resources as well. And especially in light of like the defund movement and the realities that like, for the most part, you know, we the people don't want to be gassed and shot up um, while exercising our constitutional rights. Um, I think this is just like another form of like manipulation of the people and of the reality, you know, of realities, you know, you've got on the one hand, a protest movement that is chanting defund the police and uh, is being brutalized on the streets. And then you have this other part of that same apparatus saying in order to keep you safe from, you know, right wingers, we need more money and more um, collusion at all levels um, you know, it kind of harkens back to that 1950s era where, you know, sooner or later your neighbors are going to start being paid, especially during a pandemic when a lot of people have lost their income, uh, to be spying on what, you know, is being labeled today as extremist behavior. You know, whether, whether that is far right, far left, um, black extremists, you know, the abortion extremists, like, you know, the, the feds have a whole category of different kinds of extremists. But, you know, I guess kind of going back to what we were talking about before, the definitions for all of this stuff are so broad and ambiguous that they can be interpreted in a myriad of ways that could be problematic. Um, you know, even just like the, the laws that are being discussed with regard to like, quote unquote, domestic terrorism, 
you know, they never really define words within um, in the statute, like uh, coerce. You know, what does it mean to coerce a government? Uh, you know, if I stand in front of a courthouse with signs and I'm chanting something, is that coercing the government? You know, if so, I mean, that's that's the problem with a lot of these laws. And like I said, you know, I think it is more meant to scare people into submission than to to do anything real. Like the um, that domestic terrorist um, definition that was uh, just put out by the FBI and Homeland Security. Um, it says domestic terrorism for the FBI's purposes is referenced in U.S. Code 18 U.S.C. 2331 subpart 5 and is defined as activities that uh, involve acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state. So if you break any law of any state or federal government and someone describes your act as dangerous to human life, um, and then the next part says, and appears to be intended to, quote, intimidate or coerce a civil civilian population. Intimidate or coerce uh, is really, really broad. You right. know, could a, a boycott could be deemed intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then it goes on to say, um, if your act is intended to influence the policy of government by intimidation or coercion. Well, that's what protest is about, is trying to influence the policy of government. And then again, you've got those same words by intimidation or coercion. I mean, if you are a soft shelled individual, what is intimidating or coercive to you is going to be very different than to someone else. Especially when a lot of these actions that this is applied to, like for instance, recently there's two people in Washington that are facing uh, charges, including I think terrorism charges for, um, involving like low level sabotage to railroad mm -hmm. lines in solidarity with the wet sweat and struggle where they set off essentially like a, a warning signal to a train. Right. And there was actually an interesting article about this in the local press up there where they actually interviewed both railroad union and also inspectors. And they said, look, the only thing this does is it sends a warning light to the train tracks that says they've got to check it. So, yeah, but still they're being charged with, um, terrorism when they were essentially the electronic version of lighting a bag of dog poop on fire. Yeah. And or act some sort of economic cost. One call. Right. You know, exactly. That would maybe be more analogous. Right. Which is a misdemeanor. Exactly. Right. But still, this is being charged as terrorism and presented in the media as essentially like they were trying to derail a train and kill everybody. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have been following that action because it also is a little bit similar to some of the valve turner cases that we've done. You know, in the valve turners, they um, called these pipeline companies and said, you know, in 10 minutes, we're going to turn off this safety valve, you know, similar to the mechanism on the tracks that was used. And they'd done a lot of research, you know, about the, using this, I think, similar to the Washington situation that is pending, you know, that you're referring to. And it was actually the pipeline companies themselves that were required by their own, you know, safety rules and laws to voluntarily shut down their system in response to a call like that. So the company basically did what they do on a regular basis whenever they're checking the lines, uh, cleaning them, you know, doing inspections. This is like a regular thing that they do. Uh, this time they did it in response to an activist calling and saying like, hey, if you don't, you know, shut this down, we're going to turn the safety valve. And I think that um, that Washington case to me seems really analogous in that instead of a pipeline, they're using a train line, but it's similar where all it does is trigger a safety mechanism that the train has to comply with that slows the works down, you know, and to call that terrorism 
um, or to call that, uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to hear something, you know, what, what we would see in many other states is, you know, they'd be charged with these felony critical energy infrastructure laws, um, which are also completely BS, but, um, but yeah, we'll, you know, we'll see. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there were, there was a group of activists that got charged with a terrorist type crime for dropping a banner that had glitter on it. And the glitter went to like the floor of the state house and, uh, they all got, you know, initially charged with these like serious terrorist crimes for basically deploying a banner where some of the glitter, you know, went off the banner and landed on the floor. Um, you know, we see similar things like this where, um, it just sort of exposes the collusion between prosecutors and corporations and or the politicians that are in the back pocket of those corporations, especially when we're talking about the fossil fuel industry. But I think, you know, even broader and more generally, it's true time and time again. But just to go forward, you know, I'm curious, there's been a sizable pushback in terms of people writing editorials and articles uh, against uh, calls for more uh, domestic terrorism laws. There's been a large petition that's been signed by everybody from the NAACP to the ACLU. Um, Amnesty International, the SPLC, has signed on to it. Politicians like AOC have come out against new domestic terrorism laws. I'm just curious to know, in your eyes, it, you know, is there anything effective that people could do to kind of push back or, you know, put pressure on people to say like, look, we don't, we don't want this. Or do you think that they've already kind of made up their minds in terms of what they're going to go forward with? I think both. <laughs> I mean, I think all tools in the toolbox, you know, I, I, I think that it is important for people to be exposing the raw truth of the matter. You know, I think it is important for people to be explaining the history of this as a tactic. Um, you know, I think sign on letters showing solidarity have a place as well. Um, but I also think, you know, like I mentioned before that we see this time and time again. Um, and I think taking the teeth out of the, snake for lack of a better analogy is also important. You know, I think it's important for people to be repeating, like no matter what label they put on the newest law, no matter, um, you know, whether they make it a felony or a misdemeanor, really a lot of what they are responding to is the fact that there are people on the left and right that are willing and able to break the law and risk going to jail and risk punishment, regardless of what label they put on it. You know, whether they call it violating criminal energy infrastructure, whether it's criminal mischief, whether it is sabotage, arson, you know, et cetera, et cetera, people who are engaged in direct action are pretty much knowingly breaking the law and taking a risk. So, yeah, I think it's important to expose bad behaviors. And I think it's also really important for people to be really careful about being used by the machine, you know, by giving their tacit approval to something uh, that will likely be turned around and used against them. Um, and, you know, we see we've already seen some of that as well. Like I was actually pretty, uh, you know, I was pleased at the number of organizations that were coming out saying, um, you know, speaking against this framing of increasing laws and punishments, because at this very moment, there is at least some innuendo that the intent is for it to be used against far right extremists that are really the only uh, you know, political movement right now that is targeting human life with murder, you know, so 
even though they are distinct and um, using tactics uh, and strategies that are very different than anything the left you know, has ever used, uh, even in its more, more radical forms, um, I, I know, for instance, like when you look at what the policy words are on paper, it does not say far right. You know, it's the context being provided by Congress people that is saying, like, we're intending to use this for the far right extremist stuff that happened at the Capitol. But the law, the the language that's being put down on paper doesn't say that it could be used either way. And when you pair that type of really ambiguous language with some of the other laws that we're seeing in at the state level, you know, Florida being, you know, the perfect example where DeSantis basically tried to um, pass a state level um, domestic terrorist type of law that was specifically targeting Antifa. Um, and it was a bill that he tried to push through in September but now that this quote unquote crisis uh, has, you know, ensued and everybody's talking about it, they're kind of using that moment to try to use hysteria to push through something while everybody is freaking out, um, you know, and in Florida, especially because there are a lot of those, you know, Q conspiracy theorists and, and Trumpers and, and other folks they, you know, there is like a narrative that basically, you know, um, astoundingly attempts to claim that, uh, you know, Antifa went undercover as the far right and, you know, stormed the Capitol and all that other lunacy. So following the plan, 4D chess all the way. When you step into that quagmire, it normally does not work out well for us. You know, that's, I guess that's what I would say. I, you know, I think it is important to educate people. I think it's important to explain why. Um, I also think it's really important to take a step back too and, and talk about like how broken the systems are that this is the conversation we're having in the wake of this. You know, in some ways it's sort of like someone is bleeding out you know, on the right hand side and on the left hand side, you're talking about, you know, how we should be acquiring more band-aids or something like that. It just like the two things just are not in line with each other in terms of like problem and solution. Uh, and when I see things like, oh, the, the feds are going to engage in a threat assessment. I'm like, oh, I would just so love to be a fly in the room, you know, during yeah. that conversation. Like, I mean, it, the realities that they um, say out loud in words um, are sometimes just so delusional as to just be really overtly um, motivated for a you know a particular purpose that's definitely not the strengthening of our democracy. <laughs> You're listening to It's Going Down, part of the Channel Zero Anarchist Podcast Network. Follow us online at itsgoingdown.org and on Twitter at IGD underscore news. In order for It's Going Down to continue into the future, though, we need your support. Go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop to sign up to donate monthly or give us a one-time donation. Again, go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop and sign up to donate monthly or give us a one-time donation in order for us to grow our work into 2021. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to it. Well, just going forward, I'm curious, you know, since last year, hundreds of people have been arrested and faced pretty harsh charges, of course, much more so than the people, the far right uh, protesters in DC. I'm just curious do you think that these charges will continue under Biden or they will trickle off or we will even see some of these charges drop? It's interesting because 
in a lot of the states where uh, CLDC is defending BLM protesters, you know, the one thing that we have really overtly seen is just far more felony riot charges and like felony charges in general being put upon uh, activists for things that normally would not have risen to that level. And it's pretty clear to me that it's sort of like a two pronged reasoning. One is you're chanting a cab, you know, one is you are like overtly calling out the cops as being, you know, a huge part of the problem. And the cops basically decide how they're going to write out that ticket. Uh, and then they hand that ticket off to the prosecutor who is their best buddy. And the two of them, you know, figure out what you're going to be charged with and how the case is going to move forward. And so in a lot of places we're seeing, um, you know, even like here in Eugene, the Lane County district attorney's office for, you know, a long time has been claiming like no plea deals unless you plead to felony riot. And that is like really unprecedented for this, office and just in general. And I think that um, in large part, they are doing a solid for their buddies, you know, in cop land to like not let anti cop protesters off the hook lightly. Like I think in part that is what's going on, especially here in Oregon and places where, um, you know, there are largely white protests happening. In a lot of other places in the country, I would add that like that systemic racism piece is also very much at play where people of color are finding themselves charged with more severe crimes than perhaps their white counterparts would be under similar circumstances. Um, so I think that's going on. But what I think is going to be, you know, right now, because of the pandemic, courts are basically frozen in time. I mean, I can't tell you how many trials we have pu pushed into spring, summer, fall at this point. And so there are hundreds and thousands of protest cases that are just lining up for trial in courthouses all around the country you know, from the city level to the federal level. And at some point, um, prosecutors as practicality will have to make some decisions on where their priorities are because they've also got people sitting in jail cells facing, you know, murder and other really serious felony charges that are going to take priority. And so I think that there is like a practicality that has yet to really um, find its way into, um, you know, the more immediate decision making processes that is going to be interesting to see how that's going to unfold in the spring and summer. The harsh part of it is that, like, for a lot of our activist clients, they're all on bond or bail or pretrial release for this whole time period. So in some ways people are benched and, you know, almost like they're on probation for a year or, you know, almost a year at this point without even being found guilty of anything. And especially when you are on bail or pretrial release for felonies, not only is that like stressful to the individual, but, employers don't like that. Um, you know, the bail conditions are usually higher. You know, we've got one client that like every time he wants to cross state line, which is like 10 miles from his house, he has to ask a judge permission, you know, because of his pretrial release. So it's, you know, a, it's a huge pain in the ass on the, on the practical for all of these folks that are kind of strung up in the legal system as the legal system limps through the pandemic. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that uh, in this New York Times article that just came out, they're talking about sort of how Barr was pushing uh, you know, the DOJ and DHS and the FBI to really go after anarchists and anti-fascists in particular. And they're talking about just exactly what you're saying is that they were hit with the coronavirus. And it also talks about how 
when the George Floyd rebellion erupted, you know, they're basically being pushed by the government to go after anarchists, people on the left, Black Lives Matter, anti-fascist, blah, blah, blah. And they're kind of searching in the dark for something that doesn't exist. And then they're also putting aside all these other cases they were working on involving, according to the New York Times, three percenters, Oath Keepers, uh, and violent white supremacists. And then, of course, you know, this thing in the Capitol happens. I'm just curious, will all of that focusing on all the hundreds of cases that they're dealing with at the Capitol, and they really seem to be going after people pretty hard, or at least spending a lot of resources on that, do you think that will make an impact on other things? Like, will they have to basically put stuff down to take that on? Yeah. You know, I think what they're going to do is open up the money pipeline more and just pump more money and cops and resources into it and justify, you know, larger budgets for them rather than necessarily like, quote unquote, putting other things aside. That's historically, you know, what we would see happen. But on a on a realistic basis, you know, with some of the anti-fascist cases that we're working on, I'm definitely saying like our client is accused of throwing a water bottle at a Nazi. <laughs> Are you sure that this is a case you want to continue to prosecute in light of the fact that that Nazi is now being investigated by the feds as having stormed the Capitol? Is that really a case we're going to go to a jury trial on at some point? And at this point, you know, we haven't, they haven't dropped those cases yet. They are definitely still pending, but I mean, I, it'll be really interesting if we do actually get to the point of, um, picking juries and putting these cases on trial. You know, I'm really interested in, you know, like for instance, we've got this one case in Portland, Oregon, um, where, you know, a bunch of, Far right extremists came to town, did a bunch of, you know, bad stuff. And then a small handful of people, uh, basically tried to like make them leave, you know, with low level things. Um, and one of them is even charged with a measure 11 mandatory minimum, uh, crime for, for that. But the quote unquote victims that were like inside this little Nazi bus, all are just, you know, the shittiest of human beings. And I keep trying to like tell the prosecutor, like, we're going to have so much fun destroying your victim (laughs) on the stand in front of 12 (laughs) Portland jurors. You're like, I mean, if you think this is going to go well for you, um, probably not. And then, you know, prosecutors do have a whole bunch of discretion, So it really makes me think like why, you know, if this prosecutor is looking at this case and is looking at the political climate that we are currently in, especially in the Northwest, um, why would you be using time and resources to push that case forward unless there was like something else going in the background, you Hmm. know, and that something else in the background, I don't think we should take our eyes off of. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it needs to make us more paranoid. I just think we just need to be aware of it. I wanted to turn now to something that the director of the FBI stated uh, recently that they said that the biggest threat was coming from anti-government far-right militias, boogaloo boys, and they also said anarchists. And uh, we know that the FBI has created this uh, thing where they've grouped you know, anti-government people on the far-right along with what they call anti-authority anarchists together just like they've done um you know basically neo-nazis alongside black lives matter and call them like racially motivated extremists i'm just curious do you think that this statement signals to by the fbi that they want to go after quote both sides or they're just conflating militias as quote anarchists or both (laughs) i mean i definitely think that you know they've never stopped going after anarchists and or anti-capitalists. So I would definitely say that that statement um, is akin to, you know, Trump's statement, you know, there are very fine people on both sides. You know, I mean, um, in some ways, that's just like the, the, you know, gross part of politics. But I definitely do think that um, 
they are not going to stop going after um, anti-fascists and, and uh, you know, an- anarchists, anti-capitalists. In some ways, I think that um, when they use the word, quote unquote, anarchist, instead of using anti-fascist, you know, anarchist has been such a boogeyman word for, you know, since what, the 30s, you know, the 20s. Um, and I think that anti-fascism, you know, it's funny because when, when we're doing public speaking on it, you know, we talk about like there are anti-fascists and there are pro-fascists. Which side do you want to be on? You know, and trying, you know, we, we all have stickers that say, you know, everyday anti-fascist and just trying to like take that word anti-fascist and, um, you know, make it more acceptable for liberals and, you know, maybe more, uh, less left, uh, people to kind of take it up the moniker. And so, when I see them using the word anarchist instead of anti-fascist or anti-racist, um, you know, that's very, very purposeful. That's marketing more than anything else. You know, I mean, I think rather than it being, um, you know, vernacularly correct or historically correct or anything like that, I think that that is narrative spin. They're still hoping that there was enough bad um, blood between, you know, the nineties and anarchists and the left that like somehow that will divide, um, the left, you know, into smaller factions that make it less powerful. I wanted to read another quote and get your, uh, get your thoughts on it. This is from an NBC news article where it said FBI officials have said for years that they have felt hamstrung in their approach to domestic extremists because the government has been loath to use the surveillance tools deploys against al-Qaeda and ISIS adherents to Americans who hold radical political beliefs that may lead some of them to violence. And I, I have a feeling that that you would find this, um, uh, laughable considering just, yeah, sad for them. Sad for them that there's a thing called the Constitution and some, you know, basic civil liberties protections for humans. That's makes life, you know, hamstrung, apparently. Yeah, that that is just like a total self-serving, you know, bit of drivel, I would say, because number one, um, the FBI claiming that they are hamstrung in their approach to domestic extremists factually does not hold true. Really, it's their ineptness and their inability to do investigative law enforcement that has hamstrung them. They could have all the tools in the world and they still couldn't punch their way out of a paper bag. So, um, you know, I think that is in part, uh, you know, their, their, their problem. And I think that surveillance, um, of Americans and of Americans who are engaging in politics um, is what allegedly differentiates us from a lot of other more repressive regimes in the world. And so, um, you know, it's too bad that there are some checks and balances to the, um, you know, huge power, money, uh, resources that law enforcement already has to use against us. Um, But, you know, but yeah, that's, I guess, what I would say to that. Um, and that, you know, certainly, you know, they have had very, very little luck in going after Al Qaeda and ISIS for a whole host of reasons, not because of the lack of money and or, um, you know, no holds barred um, rules of engagement that have been provided to them. So I also think it's like Islamophobic and, um, you know, just a fallacy to ever equate ISIS um, and U.S. based political activities, even if those activities are utilizing um, you know, arson and property damage and direct action as tactics to to compare those 
things is um, manipulative and false. I wanted to ask now, there is going to be more of a buildup of repressive state forces. I'm curious what would that look like? And I wanted to go back to what we were talking about before we started recording about this new law in Oregon about courts trying to push you to allow your phone to be unlocked. I'm just curious, you know, that seems to be kind of the the new frontier sort of for the state to go after, whether it's like get into your phone to like uh, decrypt signal or other apps like that that are encrypted or to focus more on like online surveillance. I'm just curious your thoughts in general on that sort of front. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, there are a lot of really smart people um, that know technology and surveillance far better than I do. And it's going to be really important for those folks to, um, you know, be monitoring and educating the rest of us um, and finding those push points. I also think that um, with, you know, when I first read that cell phone opinion in Oregon, um, you know, we had a small conversation and most of the people in the room were like, yeah, well, I guess I'd go to jail before I would give up the password to my cell phone, um, whether there was a warrant or not. Um, and that's based, you know, not only on a privacy right, on a constitutional right, but also on a security culture, you know, component. I mean, we had a federal court case where the court ruled that your cell phone is the equivalent of a hundred filing cabinets full of highly confidential documents. And if people just start um, glibly giving that level of information to local level cops in response to a search warrant, um, you know, the amount of damage that could be done by that is pretty staggering. The other reality, though, is like, what are they going to do? Put all those people in jail? You know, like hundreds and thousands of people refuse to voluntarily give up a hundred filing cabinets full of confidential information and the jails just start filling up with people who hold on to their U.S. constitutional rights. That could be an interesting um, turn of events, I guess. But, you know, I think... Uh, like I mentioned to you, there are already exceptions to the search warrant requirements. There are already exceptions for law enforcement to violate your constitutional rights under certain circumstances. Um, and then you have the right to challenge those exceptions in court after the fact. And um, I think there are a lot of people, whether it's in the grand jury context or in the contempt of court context in this situation, who would choose jail, you know, and, and I think that the, the courts and the system need to see that that is really the case, that, you know, there's a push and pull of power, you know, the court system, the legal system wants to hold on to that power. And then the people are like, how many more laws and restrictions are you going to put on us? You know, how much farther are you going to stick that light up our nose, um, you know, as that big brother power? And I think as that push and pull um, happens over time, we, you know, we see different victors and, um, you know, and different outcomes happening. In a lot of states now, uh, various Republican officials are pushing like rehashed anti Black Lives Matter or anti pipeline laws. And I'm just curious, you know, your thoughts on this and also how people can respond. It's going to take multiple levels, I think. Um, you know, number one, I think it, important is like doing the research and sort of exposing who is funding and drafting these anti protest laws. They all kind of tend to funnel back to the same sources. And so, um, you know, following the money trails, exposing that information, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, doing outreach and education is going to be important. Um, you know, 
becoming one of those legislators uh, and pushing against those types of laws is another thing that probably needs to happen. Um, I think that from maybe the more radical left direct action perspective, um, the, like I mentioned before, the, you know, the, the label on the law, you know, whatever new set of anti-protest laws we're talking about is not really going to have any deterrence effect on whether someone decides to engage in direct action, especially for um, causes like catastrophic climate change or systemic racism. You know, those are just causes that people are already risking arrest for them on a daily basis and pushing through a new set of laws, anti-protest laws that are very, very clearly gifts to the industry, you know, like these critical energy infrastructure laws, for instance, as a form of a new anti-protest law. I mean, that's basically just a gift being given to the oil and gas industry by its friends and lobbyists that are, you know, sort of railroading the democratic process for their benefit. And I think a lot of the anti-protest laws, when you follow them back to their source, have similar things where they're, you know, far right or anti-abortion or, you know, whatever it happens to be. So recon, education, um, you know, being at the table. Um, and then I think, you know, in terms of like lawyers like us, you know, we really need to like increase our numbers so that people who do choose to uh, test the waters with some of these anti-protest laws, feel confident that they are going to have high caliber pro bono legal representation. And we're going to do everything we possibly can to make the state work as hard as possible and to get as little punishment as possible for the activists that we represent that are going to be on the front lines, you know, testing these new boundaries. But I think, you know, given the state of the world and, and where we're at on many, many levels, there is really no time to uh, sit around and wait and see, um, you know, how different things are going to play out. And I think, you know, in the criminal context, um, you know, part of fighting the state as hard as we can on behalf of somebody who's being prosecuted is also to challenge the constitutionality of those laws and use the criminal court process to legis to litigate and legislate uh, these anti-protest laws, but also to help campaigns, um, you know, gain media traction and, uh, you know, to use the courtroom as an educational vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it's not a single answer. I would say like there are, you know, all tools are going to be needed and always are needed um, to respond to state repression, which this type of legislation is just one example of it. Um, and state repression has always been, uh, you know, on board with activists. Um, it, it just the tune changes, but the melody remains the same, I guess. Um, and so. I think people should not overly freak out. Um, you know, if they live in a state where some new crackerjack law, um, you know, gets passed, there's a lot of work for you to be doing there. Like, who are the people that voted for it? Who are the people that drafted it? Who funded them? Who funded the law? Like, who's talking positively about it? Who, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of work that needs to be done at all levels. Um, you know, from those that are going to clog up the streets to those that are helping to clog up the courtrooms. And I think that's, you know, part of mass movement building. You know, uh, something a friend told me recently uh, that really stuck with me was that we can't be so terrified of the repression that's yet to come that we forget about the things that are already happening right now and, and dealing with that. And I'm just curious, you know, in the face of all this, what advice would you give people either in terms of if they wanted to kind of enter the world into the work that the CLDC is doing 
or just in general pushing back against repression? What can movements and people be doing? Well, I think um, we need to put our best and brightest and most strategic and, um, you know, smartest people to work on some really hard stuff. Um, you know, like what the next strategies are, um, in combating a lot of the issues that the left currently faces are not easy. It's not, it's going to be a lot more than just clicking the like button on Facebook. Um, and we have been a little bit, um, distracted and scattered in terms of really kind of focusing on, um, you know, especially right now, like how are we going to take this moment and really propel the movement and the core goals of that movement forward? You know, that idea that we need to really come together around a few primary goals that as the left we can develop varying strategies and we can use a whole host of uh, tactics in order to get there. But, um, you know, we, we tend to have very short attention spans, um, and we tend to procrastinate the hard work till some other day. And I feel like it's really time for us to um, start meeting in small groups and even larger groups and really wrestling with some hard stuff um, that's going to take a lot of brain power. But we we have, you know, we have that power. Um, it's just that it's been easier to organize a bunch of people into a parking lot to do a march and a banner and a, a party in a parking lot as a tactic. Um, and hold signs and, you know, and get a one shot media deal. Um, that's easier to do than really trying to figure out, um, what is actually going to push the movement, um, closer to its goals and, and, and to a finish line. Um, and how can we as a movement, you know, in our, in our know your rights trainings, maybe, and I can end you with this, but like we've been really going back to the St. Paul principles and really trying to push the St. Paul principles as part of the education that CLDC is, um, trying to make, especially newer activists aware of. And the St. Paul principles in general just says like we can use a variety of tactics. And we don't need to shit on each other's tactics. We are able to deploy a variety of tactics in harmony toward a goal. And then, of course, you know, the other part of it is like, and no part of our movement should be cooperating with the state against that movement. Um, and so, you know, I think Going back to 2008, um, when those principles were um, first drafted, you know, I think it's real. You know, I, I think they're more timely now than they were even then. Um, and I think that um, people who want to get involved, um, just you know, I think we need to spend some more time in the thinking deeply, writing you know, deeply talking to each other, which of course is hard during a pandemic, but um, there's just a lot of trust building and intellectualizing that I think also needs to be done before we just start knee jerk uh, deploying tactics. For sure. Well, in closing, uh, how can people support uh, CLDC? Can they donate? And I know you all are doing a lot of trainings, a lot of online stuff. Is there where where can people go to kind of get up to date and more information? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, our website is CLDC.org and we are a nonprofit um, and we you know defend thousands of activists for free. So we certainly are thankful for donations. Um, but yeah, since the pandemic started, we took all of our know your rights trainings online 
and we've been recording them. Um, and if you request a link and a password, you can, you know, watch all of these various know your rights trainings that we've been doing on topics, you know, ranging from like I did a six hour, three session, um, know your rights training for climate activists that not only goes over like how to interact with cops, but it also does, you know, do probably an entry level dive into state repression, security culture, digital security, like all the foundational components that you have to have under your belt before you can really fly as an activist. Um, You know, there's a lot of um, skill building and prep work that people need to do before they can just be going off and getting themselves arrested. And so our hope was, during the pandemic, while a lot of people, you know, are unable to kind of take the risks that might they might normally take, use that time to get a head full of updated information, um, particularly with regard to like how the law may impact your risk assessment. Because I think that's the other, maybe the other big takeaway is, you know, and circling back around, you know, we started talking at the beginning about uh, the FBI and the federal government engaging in a threat assessment with regard to developing policies around domestic terrorism. And threat assessment is also something that we do uh, and should do on a regular, regular basis. And oftentimes people um, tell me that they are intimidated or scared to engage in like a threat assessment, especially if they're doing anti-fascist work. But in my experience, going through a set threat assessment and thinking about, uh, you know, what are your threats? What are your vulnerabilities? What are the mitigation measures that you know exist? Oftentimes, by the time you get to the end of that process, you actually feel more confident and more empowered to do the work that you want to do than otherwise. And so, you know, we should be using those the same, uh, you know, approach that the government is using right now in uh, take a step back, do a threat assessment, know the risks before you engage in them so that you are aware and ready to respond to the potential consequences, whether that is being interrogated by the FBI when they show up at your door, whether that is doing 21 years in federal prison like Marius Mason. Um, you know, there are consequences, um, some of which can be somewhat predicted and others that can't. But the reality is that, um, you know, as movement actors, um, you know, if you are unable to deal with the worst case consequences, you probably shouldn't be engaging in that as a tactic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I just want to encourage people to check out the Civil Liberties Defense Center Check out their trainings. They have some really amazing stuff. Follow them on social media. Amazing resource. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. And thanks for talking with us. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. This has been the It's Going Down podcast. Check itsgoingdown.org for daily updates, columns, action reports, and news. Go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop to support us. And follow us on all social media platforms. IGD your daily resource for insurgent proletarian life.